This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome. I'm, I'm Tom Nyland. I uh, am a professor here in the Department of Psychiatry. And um, I'm going to tell you right up front my, my biased view of this topic, and, and biased only because of the setting in which I work in. I, I direct the post traumatic stress disorder program at the VA hospital. And I've been there for about 20 years. Um, and I, I do research both in veterans but in civilians. And, this is, of course, a very a topic very much germane to my field. But one of the things I want to kind of state right from the beginning is that the topic was about disasters. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll actually go through Hurricane Katrina as an example. But one of the take home um, lines is that, um, that most people are resilient. And uh, in the setting of disasters, it's still very unclear what is the role of somebody like myself, you know, in the the immediate aftermath of a large scale disaster, because um, many people show immediate symptoms of distress, and most people will recover, and it's very arguable about how beneficial it is to have a team of mental health people go into an acute disaster zone, and sending the message that. You know, you might be psychologically scarred from this event, so let's talk to you about your mental health. Um, it, it may be that the, it's all about timing. It's like what the, the role of a mental health professional like myself probably isn't in the first few days after a disaster. It may be in the first month, you know, in those people who are not recovering. Um, so the, anyhow, that's actually, that's one of the kind of the take home bottom line messages I want to emphasize. I am going to talk about various aspects of disasters. I will tell you a little bit about PTSD because that's what I do. Um, it's arguable, uh, and there's some empirical evidence for this, that different types of disasters are perhaps more psychologically impactful. Um, and uh, you know, whether or not there's some you know, hurricane disaster or natural event, of an earthquake versus some interpersonal violence, you know, mass violence, where there's a human-to-human -human, um, interaction that for, for, you know, in some circumstances, it's easier to adjust to some natural event than it is to uh, some mass violence where it's, you know, where you're victimized by other fellow, fellow human beings. Um, I am going to just focus right now on that first topic here, the natural disaster, because I was kind of going off the word disaster, which is the title of the talk. But I will talk to you about different aspects of trauma exposures and how they each have dif differential risk for, for PTSD and other mental health outcomes. So this is a, a satellite photograph of Hurricane Katrina. And of course, you know, we all heard a lot about Hurricane Katrina because it was a an extraordinary disaster. It, it, it very rapidly became a, uh, it started out as a tropical storm and it became a category five hurricane, you know, hours before it hit landfall. It was roughly 200 miles in, in diameter and the storm surge that it brought in uh, was close, you know, topped out at 27 feet. Uh, there was a much, as much as 18 inches of rainfall that happened. And it, you know, it was a catastrophe that <clears throat> damaged the Gulf Coast, um, mostly Louisiana, but Mississippi too. And 80% uh, of New Orleans, as you know, was flooded, 78,000 homes destroyed, 1,833 people died. There's actually a large number of people who just disappeared and no one still to this day knows what happens to them. But confirmed deaths, 1,833, and roughly 
uh, you know, $108 billion of, of property damage. Um, and this, these are photographs you've probably seen before. Um, um, the government response, of course, came under a lot of scrutiny. Um, there was a natural, you know, there was a disaster declared. Coast Guard and the National Guard were mobilized, but um, you know, the, the fact is that it just took much longer than people thought was uh, reasonable. Um, the, New Orleans needed to be fully evacuated. 80% um, of the population you know, were attempted to be evacuated, and there were tens of thousands of people stranded. Um, and it took many days for the National Guard and the Coast Guard to, to rescue everybody. Uh, FEMA was uh, mobilized, of course, and of course it, it became, uh, you know, uh, it was politically disastrous for, uh, for the administration at the time. They had to supply housing for over 700,000 people. And to this day, New Orleans' uh, um, population has not rebounded from Hurricane Katrina. So uh, the, the latest, most detailed census was uh, in 2013, and there was 378,000 people living in New Orleans proper. And right at the time of Katrina hit, it was around 455,000. Um, there was a lot of non-governmental responses, the Red Cross, Salvation Army, uh, the public certainly did mobilize. Four point two five billion dollars raised in donations by the public. Uh, there was a billion dollars roughly in corporate donations. Uh, volunteer agencies provide temporary shelter, food and clothing, and and again, this is um, um, it, the there, there's tremendous goodwill on the part of. Uh, you know, non-government agencies, as, as well as, you know, well-meaning government officials. And it's real, it still is a, de a debate as to, is there a role for mental health people in the immediate aftermath? Um, and, you know, it, it, when you sh see these photographs, you realize that what, what these people need are food and clothing and shelter, the most basic needs. Um, and I think that is one of the punchline messages in, in disasters, is that that really has to come first. Um, and there's even potentially something iatrogenic about coming in and saying, you know, this is a terrible thing that happened to you. You might have, you might be at risk for post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, um, this is a, some of the notorious FEMA um, trailers uh, that were, you know, set up around New Orleans at the time. Um, and of course, you know, there was a lot of criticism, um, failure to implement evacuation plans. Uh, it was delayed response to the flooding. There were stranded victims, um, and you know families were remained separated for prolonged periods of time. And overall, it was very clear that that there was not, no one was prepared for the scale of this disaster and what was needed to, to help. Um, there have been a, a slew of sort of post Katrina studies of the psychological effects. Um, Various samples from different people, including some of the first responders. Um, this is, I'm just showing you, there's some data here from evacuees in Houston who were uh, surveyed and looked at, uh, there's a scale called the impact of event scale, which is sort of a PTSD symptom thermometer. Um, and at the time, which was only a few months after Katrina, the 38% had moderate PTSD symptoms, 24% had severe. Um, there were surveys of New York or New Orleans police officers, firefighters, and again, about a third of first responders, uh, especially the New Orleans, um, you know, first responders were, who personally were affected, you know, whose own homes and were, that a third of them had uh, significant depression and PTSD. So uh, what are some of the risk factors pre-disaster that makes people more at risk? Um, you know, the, uh, it's the, one of the more contentious things in my field is whether or not female gender is a risk factor for, for PTSD. Um, it, there, and there's data to support that, and there's some that's confounding that. Um, within natural disasters, it appears that there is some evidence that women are more likely to endure symptoms of PTSD. Um, I think uh, studies that have tried to actually look at functional consequences, there, there you fail to see a gender effect. But as, as far as symptom reporting, it seems to be higher. Um, if you look in other categories of trauma, 
actually sexual assault, uh, where women are more are disproportionately exposed, um, they are not more at risk for uh, PTSD from sexual assault than men. Um, so within the, the realm of motor vehicle accidents, there is evidence that women are more likely to endorse higher symptoms of PTSD. So it's a thorny issue in, in the field. Um, but as far as Hurricane Katrina and other disasters, it appears that female gender is a risk factor for more mental health outcomes, adverse. Uh, another contentious area is this ethnicity. Um, there's been three studies that have uh, looked at different um, race ethnicity groups and um, and three of them have shown that if you endorse the term Hispanic for, for, for all that's worth because it's a very non-specific term um, you're more likely to report higher symptoms um, three different epi studies have shown that but actually similarly if you looked at if you said forget about symptoms I just want to look at functional impact then the Hispanic effect disappears. You know that there's just there's just higher symptom reporting in this population. Um, SES poverty is a risk factor for mental health outcomes from disaster. Um, children in the household, exposed kids, um, dislocated exposed kids in particular, any personal or family history of psych history is a is a risk factor for post disaster uh, mental health problems. Yes. I don't understand what you meant by So there, these are all survey instruments, and the, and you have forced choices of what you say you are. You know, I am a a non-Hispanic white male. You know, I have to pick one of the categories in a survey, and um, people who really do ethnography don't like the term Hispanic because it really does make a difference if you're from Puerto Rico or Colombia. Uh, or you know uh, Spain or Mexico, etc. Uh, but in sort of large-scale surveys where they only have this many items on for race ethnicity, sometimes Hispanic shows up, and take it for what it's worth. Okay. Um, anyhow, let's move on. Let's see within disaster risk factors. So. Severity of exposure in virtually every category of trauma has been shown to be a risk factor for mental health outcomes. Um, and in fact, uh, some of the more detailed information about this actually came post 9-11, where they were actually mapped out proximity to ground zero and whether or not you were immediately affected by the World Trade Center disaster, um, whether you were injured, whether you were personally under life threat. Um, there is a thing called peritraumatic reactions, and that is how, how dramatically you respond immediately during the event. And in particular, if you have symptoms of what's called dissociation, where you know, time slows down and there's a certain unreal quality to it, you feel depersonalized, these are called dissociation. That seems to be a risk factor for later mental health problems after the disaster. But just intense fear, panic, and horror has been shown to be a risk, you know, that predict that down the road you're more likely to have symptoms. Uh, and of course, more pragmatic things, which make a lot of sense. If you've been displaced from your home, you know, relocation, that's a risk factor. And then post-disaster is equally important. Um, and uh, the, um, you know, multiple disaster studies and epi studies have shown that, that you know, you know, a disaster is not just that the day it happened. It's like how, how your life has been turned upside down and how your resources have been changed or depleted. Your social support, uh, you know, has deteriorated. So there was a huge loss of population in New Orleans and, you know, whole social networks were disrupted. Um, and, of course, loss. People who lost people, people who died. There's, there's grief, bereavement. Um, you know, with, with any kind of major life stressor, especially with, with financial as, aspects, marital distress is, is common. Um, you know, and you know, one of the more sort of existential issues of being a, tra a, a victim of trauma is this sense of um, disillusionment, you know, where how can you really feel like 
the world is a safe, benevolent place. You know, if you've been, you've been seen, you know, you've, you've seen the horrors of a war zone or you've seen the horrors of a, an intense disaster, some people walk away from that with a sense of kind of nihilism and a sense of feeling disenfranchised. You know, you can't trust people. You feel, you know, alienated. Um, and often people really don't want to uh, engage with any kind of um, activity that uh, reminds them of the event, you know, so they avoid, you know, they avoid, they avoid contact, they avoid, you know, cues, things associated with uh, the trauma. Okay, kids are particularly vulnerable, especially school age kids, really young kids, you know, kindergarten or below, less so, but, you know, the school age kids are really vulnerable because because in these kinds of disasters, because there's complete upheaval for them, you know, their family, their homes, schools, um, they, they, you know, they really have, they suffer a lot. And there's been studies looked at populations, for example, areas that have been affected by tsunami. What about helpers? You know, the first responders. Um, and again, I made the point that in the in Katrina, what was particularly um, troublesome was that most of the first responders helping out in Katrina were personally, you know, uh, impacted by the disaster. So um, it's one thing to, you know, for a for, for, you know, first responder to come in who's not personally affected by it, but it's another thing when you're expected to, to function in their role as a, as a, as a police officer or a firefighter. Um, there was a tremendous amount of, um, uh, you know, absenteeism in the police department in New Orleans post Katrina. You know, people who actually were accounted for were still not reporting to work, as you know, understandably. So, uh, sleep problems are, are are really more the rule than the exception for most people exposed to a trauma. Uh, some people, a warning sign is social withdrawal. People who feel shut down, they don't want to engage with their, um, you know, people who they're close to. Um, some people start to, uh, you know, now perceive threat in their environment, and even under mundane circumstances, and I've already mentioned this sort of pessimism or cynicism that comes with it. Uh, for some people, it's a spiritual issue. You know, they feel, you know, traumatically disillusioned. You know, they no longer believe in anything benevolent. Um, so hopelessness, a sense that life is, you know, has lost meaning. And of course, there's physical consequences of, of, of psychological trauma, and actually I'll show you some data on that. Um, and unfortunately, people who have been traumatized often self-medicate with alcohol and, and, and you know, uh, drugs of abuse and, and have subsequent more problems from that. So I'm gonna say a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that is something that we kind of rediscover with every war and then we forget about it. Um, and, and, and often people think of PTSD as a VA type problem or a military problem. Uh, it's not actually, you know, the epidemiology shows that the largest population of people in the PTSD are not veterans or civilians. Um, but a lot of the literature, a lot of the descriptive writings, a lot of the research originated from soldiers and their descriptions of PTSD go back to the Iliad. Uh, you know, just really beautiful descriptions of uh, Trojan War veterans with uh, the hyper arousal and nightmares and, and exaggerated reactivity to minor stressors. Uh, Civil War, um, from the very beginning, there's been this sort of uh, understanding of the linkage between the psychological distress and autonomic, uh, you know, hyper arousal, so heart rate and uh, palpitations and. In the Civil War, that was the focus of it. It was called Soldier's Heart. Um, there's an interesting literature from, you know, the industrial age when they were in 19th century uh, Europe when they were building railroad tracks and using dynamite explosives to clear the way. And um, they they talked about railroad spine, which was sort of uh, seemed to be having to do with the kind of the concussive injury of explosives. And this is an interesting thing that keeps coming up, including our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where, you know, blast injury is sort of seen as part of the psychological trauma. Um, in World War I, it was called shell shock. Um, 
Interestingly enough, there wasn't, Laura, a dominant term in, um, in World War II other than battle fatigue. Uh, but keep in mind that people who were uh, deployed in World War II were deployed for years. Um, and what's, what's actually uh, um, not well known, at least popularly not well known, um, you know, World War II sort of was seen as the, you know, the righteous war, the right war, the great war, and like PTSD didn't exist in, the, in that. But the, the reality is we actually don't have good data on the, how much PTSD existed in World War II. But what is known is that battlefield casualties that were psychological were enormous in World War II, you know, 20 to 25% where people had to be pulled away from the front lines because of psychological issues. And that actually created a whole new um, approach to deployment in the military that started in the Korean War. And is that they no longer deployed people for years at a time. It was for a one-year tour. And in fact, in Vietnam, it became actually purposeful where they would be, you know, forward deployed back to a, you know, an air base, forward deployed back to a base. Uh, periodic deployments. And indeed, uh, Korea and, Wool and Vietnam actually hugely reduce battlefield psychological casualties. And again, that, so that was the focus. You know, the military's agenda is the, is the battlefield and what's happening in the war. Um, and they actually cured the problem by reducing deployment times and, and bringing them, you know, taking them out of the front lines periodically. And it wasn't really until the um, outspoken advocacy of the Vietnam War generation to say, wait a minute, there's, a, there's this problem that many returning soldiers are having, uh, which originally was called Vietnam Syndrome. Um, and Marty Horowitz actually was from the UCSF, who wrote about stress response symptoms. Um, because it was coming from veterans and soldiers and because the VA has a compensation system. Um, there was a lot of resistance to the idea of embracing the term PTSD. And it really took a, uh, a mandate from Congress in the late 1980s to go out and do a national probability sample of everybody who served in the Vietnam War to ask the question, was it bad for you to go to Vietnam? And it was a $20 million study and they had three, over 3,000 household interviews. Most of the people they interviewed were not engaged in VA care. Most of them were not in, had service-connected disabilities. And, and several years and $20 million and multiple interviews later, the answer was, yes, it was bad to have gone to Vietnam. And, uh, and of course, every single study, every survey study of any deployed active duty uh, has shown roughly the same rates of uh, PTSD roughly 15 to 20 percent people deployed in an active war zone, less so in, in the Persian Gulf War in 1991. So, um, but I want to emphasize that most people are resilient. Even most war, you know, combat soldiers are resilient. And the most common outcome of a trauma is no disorder. Um, and then and PTSD is just one of multiple mental health problems that can emerge in people who've, who've been traumatized. Uh, it's, you know, it's um, major depression, drug abuse, anxiety, panic disorder, eating disorders actually emerge in people who've been, who've been traumatized. But again, I want to reemphasize, most people are resilient. Okay, so this slide is complicated, but it's really, it's got great data on it and I want to walk you through it. Um, this is a study that was, um, done many years after the National Vietnam Veteran Readjustment Study. That's that big study that kind of put PTSD on the map. This one went into the civilian population and said, what's the, what are the rates of PTSD? And I'll actually show you the data. But what, what they did was that they looked at exposures of the general adult population in the United States, and this was in the mid-1990s when this happened. And so on the top line here are Exposures, what's your risk? What percentage of the adult population have been exposed to these types of traumatic events? And they broke it down by gender. So there's some, some interesting findings here. Uh, take a look at the difference between the men and women as far as just witnessing 
events, you know, traumatic events, often gruesome scenes by the side of the road or witnessing things, urban violence. Uh, so men seem to have some affinity for that, or maybe they run to the scene or whatnot, or more likely to get into accidents. It flattens out with natural disasters, which kind of makes sense. Why would there be any gender effect of being exposed to a natural disaster? Um, physical attack, uh, both groups are, you know, there's a slight edge over men. And kind of as you expect, when you start seeing sexual trauma, it flips the other way, where it's more common in women. Um, now this is data from 1995. There really weren't at the time as many women exposed to combat. There's data that's subsequently from that, that because um, 13% of people who have deployed in war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan are women. And, and there's some very interesting data about that. Now the group that had, uh, and, and of course, 9% of women, uh, adult women in the United States had, had suffered from rape. Um, a small number of men, but look, if, if men were raped, what down here is now event-specific rates of post-traumatic stress disorder. And some of the things that you see here are kind of what you might expect intuitively. So witnessing events, witnessing things that are not happening to you personally, but are happening, you see it's happening somewhere else. Relative to these other exposures, the risk of PTSD are much lower. You know, as you get into events that are more directly harmful to first physical integrity or involve sexual assault, the rates go up. And the highest rate actually are men who've been sexually assaulted. Um, the, the, what's learned from the uh, more recent data with Iraq and Afghanistan is that there actually is no sex difference in combat-related PTSD. Men and women have roughly around the same risk. That's also been true with uh, female police officers, too. There's no, there doesn't seem to be a gender sex effect. And is it because the whole gender risk factor is spurious, or is it because there's a selection bias of who goes into this type of, we have an all-volunteer army. You know, people go into, into first responders. Are they, do they represent, you know, are they represented? No one knows the answer to that. But there is no gender or sex effect for combat and police-related PTSD. What makes people at risk for mental health consequences from trauma? I already talked a little bit about female, uh, you know, sex, gender. Um, there are some other things that have been looked at. Heart rate. Um, if, if, these are a handful of emergency room studies. People who've been seen in emergency rooms, they've had a traumatic event, you know, an assault or a motor vehicle accident. And if, they, if, they're, you know, if their heart rate is greater than 90, their risk of having PTSD three months later is higher. Um, now, it's confounded by a lot of things, but still, if you account for illness, you know, injury severity and whatnot, it, it appears to be statistically significant. It does not actually turn into a useful threshold uh, because there's huge overlap between people who are resilient and people who are developing PTSD. It just means there's, it's, a, it's a statistical finding. But it, never, it doesn't meet any kind of laboratory or diagnostic threshold. Yes? Is that why some, I've heard that some uh, EDs are using beta blockers? Yeah, yeah. So, so this spurred a, 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 a real interest in this. I mean, because, you know, one of the things that I'd say that are one of the, uh, I think the mandate of our field is to try to figure out what we can do for secondary prevention. I mean, in health, as health specialists, we can't prevent wars. I mean, it, um, we can't prevent motor vehicle accidents. But is there something we can do peritraumatically that'll, that'll reduce risk? And the idea was to give a beta blocker right you know, immediately because for a couple of reasons. It's that exaggerated sympathetic activity seems to be involved with sensitizing memory and, and enhancing fear conditioning. And there's, there's a ton of animal, basic animal data showing that. And if you do fear conditioning in animals and you give them a beta blocker, um, they showed less of a fear response when you represent them with a trauma reminder. And there's, you know, there, there's, there, there's been a small number of studies that have actually tried to do this. And honestly, the question is, not, is still unresolved. Um, the, most of this work was done by a guy named Roger Pittman out of Mass General. 
And he, his, his initial study showed that it had some promise, that it was reducing subsequent responses to trauma reminders six weeks later. Uh, the, the biggest problem has been they haven't been able to randomize enough people to adequately test it. It's not easy to randomize people to, you know, and, and consent them and randomize in a drug study in an emergency room when traumatized, as you can imagine. Um, so these types of studies, um, you know, have, um, you know, kind of still need to be done. There are some naturalistic experiments, and I'm going off this slide, but it's really interesting. Um, there's a whole literature about opiates, um, pain medicines, um, that people who received an opiate pain medicine uh, in a field hospital in uh, Iraq uh, were less likely to develop PTSD than people who didn't. And there's a, there's a whole basic science of opiate signaling and fear conditioning, and it's a really intriguing idea. There's studies from kids, burn victim kids, who if they had pain treated with opiates, um, they were less likely to have PTSD symptoms down the road. And there's finally another literature showing that um, ICU patients who have had um, pressors, you know, norepinephrine, dopamine to sustain blood pressure, they are more likely to have PTSD symptoms post-ICU. On the other hand, if you got steroids, if you got steroids in the ICU, it seemed to have some protective effect. So all of this points to the idea that there are things happening right around the time of the exposure that having to do with how activated your brain is, that it's possible that theoretically you might be able to intervene in a way to lessen the likelihood that someone will have lasting symptoms. Um, other sort of, um, sort of predictors of who's going to develop PTSD symptoms, to, you know, education and IQ is weakly uh, a weak predictor. To the extent that uh, someone felt that they were truly going to die, that, seemed, that was a risk factor. That is a risk factor for sustained PTSD. And I already mentioned this, a family history of um, anxiety or mood disorder. OK. The functional neuroanatomy of responding to stress, um, it involves essentially responses in the middle part of the brain, the medial temporal lobe, the amygdala, which is the part of the brain, the limbic system, that gets very activated when you feel terrified. So it's kind of the, our limbic brain, you know, the so-called reptilian brain. The, the, um, the, the model that I'm uh, describing here is essentially a yin-yang model of the amygdala and the, and the center part of the limbic brain and the executive function of the frontal cortex. Um, and it's the orbital frontal cortex in particular that seems to modulate or dampen the amygdala. The hippocampus is a part of the uh, medial temporal lobe that's involved with memory. And it's also context. You know, is this a safe context? Is this is a familiar context. And so there's an interaction between your fear systems, your memory systems. And then all this other stuff are really sort of outputs. You know, if you have that fight and flight response, you activate the hypothalamus and the pituitary, you put out cortisol, you activate norepinephrine. But again, just to simplify, it's a yin yang model, you know, the buffering effects of the frontal lobe kind of dampening the, amyg uh, the amygdala response. And there is a story that I love to tell about Chuck Yeager, um, who was a test pilot. and you know, would, uh, uh, it, it was <clears throat> flying some prototypical, you know, jet. Uh, and the, the jet was uh, malfunctioning and it was spinning wildly out of control. And he was spiraling down to his death, basically. And, and he described his systematic approach to just go through his checklist, you know, check the valve, you know, check the fuel pump, do this, dong, 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 just down a checklist, 10, the kinds of thing they probably taught you in the Air Force. And he gets down to n number 10 or 11, and it fixes the problem. And, and the fact that he just kind of kept his eyes on the prize, his frontal lobes are working beautifully. He's not just panicking, screaming, and, and just flailing. He's just kind of going through it. Cool under the under fire. Um, that is the right stuff. 
That's the right stuff that the military tries to train in people. That's what the police you know, department tries to train. People who are able to make good executive decisions even under threatening circumstances. And you know, there's a lot of interest in trying to understand the functional neuroanatomy. Who are these people who are so resilient? And who are the people who are, who are at risk? Okay, any questions about neuroanatomy? Okay. All right. So I mentioned that it was the epidemiology of PTSD started with a focus on veterans, you know, soldiers. Um, but it was really the national comorbidity study in the mid-1990s, which has subsequently been repeated a few times. This study was trying to understand what's the prevalence of just mental health problems in the general civilian population in the United States, the adult population. And to the surprise of many, PTSD is the fifth most prevalent psychiatric disorder in the country. And the highest population are, are women. 10% of women have a lifetime risk of PTSD, roughly 5% in men. Now there's differential exposures, so women are much more likely to be exposed to uh, sexual assault, which carries high event-specific conditional risk for PTSD. And the two most commonly uh, studied groups are female rape trauma victims and mostly male uh, combat veterans. That's changed in the last decade. There's been much more balance uh, achieved here. Um, most people are resilient. A third of cases, um, though, who develop PTSD and have it at a month will still have it uh, over many years. And those people who have PTSD over many years accrue other problems. You know, 88% psychiatric comorbidity, the biggest one being depression. Um, and in men, alcohol abuse. In fact, that's one of the punchline of the National Comorbidity Study, that if you have one major psychiatric problem, you're likely to have three. Um, OK. Uh, as far as the, uh, this is, I guess that slide is a little dated since it says current war in Iraq. Um, but 17% uh, of people screen positive for PTSD, depression, and uh, generalized anxiety disorder. And of course, uh, the, the real problem here, and the real frustration for somebody like myself, where you know, the VA did not do such a good job taking care of returning war veterans from Vietnam. Uh, the VA did gear up to take care of people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. But the problem is, is that you know, uh, the young um, volunteer soldiers, the, the, the first priority for them is not to run off and see the psychiatrist at the VA when they come back. So there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of uh, disinterest. And of course, as you've known, there's, there's variable access to health care, too, in the VA. Uh, we're, we're lucky to have a very good VA here. We're, that's, we're not in the crosshairs and the VA scandals, but that's not been true in a lot of VAs around the country. Uh, and of course, what's unique about Iraq and Afghanistan, OEF, OAF, is redeployment. Um, and it's really, it's really just uh, astonishing to take care of veterans who have been deployed four times. Really extraordinary. <clears throat> OK. There is new criteria, but it's basically the same idea, that you've been exposed to a horrific event, and you're haunted by it. You, know, you're not, you don't really fully recover from it. So the threat usually involves some true threat of violence or, or, or injury or death to you. Um, and of course, it can be directly experienced, but you can, if, you can see it in somebody else, too, and be very traumatized to it, um, you know, or, or even learning of an accidental violent death can be a traumatic experience for people. <clears throat> um, and of course, you know, uh, trauma is not just this flashbulb memory. I mean, people can, can um, be in a horrible car accident and actually have true retrograde amnesia for the event. They actually don't remember the car accident. But they actually develop PTSD symptoms because they were in the ICU for two weeks. And they were in PT for six months. And they've seen gruesome photographs of the, of the accident scene. And they've had people again and again tell them how horrific it was. And, and it constructs a, a traumatic narrative that can take on an intrusive you know, quality to it. OK. So 
you've been exposed to something and then you feel as if you re-experience it. And you, sometimes it's in the form of intrusive memories, sometimes it's nightmares at night. Um, there's, uh, and, and people often develop avoidance um, for reminders. So, you know, for a lot of uh, veterans who are, who are exposed to IED blasts, just being on a highway, a crowded highway in rush hour was a, you know, was a, was a scary event. Um, and some people, that's too much, and they, they avoid that. And just think about how impaired, just think how impaired you'd be if you couldn't get on the highways, you know, and you live in the Bay Area. Um, there are negative moods and cognition, mostly depression, but some of it is sort of that, I mentioned that disillusionment, and, um, and it's not always about fear. Sometimes it's feelings of guilt and shame, uh, estrangement, um, the lack of the ability to enjoy, you know, experience joy. Um, there's hyperarousal, that's kind of the prototypical symptom of PTSD, and they, th th these symptoms are persistent. Um, they're, they're, they're more or less universal in people in the first few days after a disaster. If they're persistent for a month, then that's really when that, that becomes more of a problem. And these symptoms are, have to have some negative impact on your life for it to be considered a disorder. And by the way, there's kind of a, a really robust debate in the Defense Department about the term PTSD. They're really trying to use the term PTS, take out the word disorder. And it's, an, it's a very interesting, uh, it, it comes from the right motivation. They really want to encourage more people to get help and get treated for it, uh, which is a good thing. And, and more people have. Um, and taking out the D, the disorder, you know, kind of serves that purpose. Uh, at the same time, though, um, you know, in order for it to be a clinical entity, it really has to be something more than just symptoms. It has to be something that really is impairing your life, and that's the reason to get treatment. So I don't have the answer to that dilemma, but I just want to let you know that that's a debate that's happening. Okay, I mentioned that PTSD is the fifth most prevalent disorder. Um, so uh, major depression and um, actually alcohol are, are, are some of the larger um, entities, simple phobias, social phobias. But panic disorder is, uh, isn't as common as PTSD. So I mean, it's actually a lot more prevalent than people realize. And, and maybe you don't realize it because, because trauma often has elements of shame and avoidance that you know, people won't volunteer, that they've, they've been traumatized. They, they, they prefer not to. So the real issue is, uh, the longitudinal course. What, you know, arguably, you can say that what, what the real issue is recovery. What, what is the normal recovery? Um, now, let me go, go back on topic about disasters. You know, what were the things that actually predicted recovery in Manhattan post 9-11? You know, most people did recover. There was a flare of symptoms. They had these beautiful telephone epidemiology surveys of lower Manhattan. And sure enough, there were you know, high symptoms of PTSD in the first six months post 9-11, but repeat assessments showed that most people are recovered. And what, are, and, and what, what, what facilitates recovery? Um, it's more, you know, social support, you know, interpersonal engagement. Uh, negative life events you know, is a negative pro, you know, you know, risk factor for persistent symptoms. Did you have a question? Uh, doctor, I, have some, I know people that were there. What we see in them is something we call cognitive dissonance, where their belief structure is so powerful, it denies and blocks their ability to accept the information they're experiencing in real time. So they delay, they, they're behaving, they're following orders, they're working there, they're cleaning up, they're taking the dead bodies out and all. They're in a state of heart, but they're not experiencing it because they're cognitively dis yeah. disassociated from the experience. However, the trauma doesn't go away. It's just delayed. Unfortunately, it's delayed until a point where we don't have any treatment for these people and they're really struggling. But is that something you witness in veterans also? Or? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, in Vietnam they said, don't mean nothing. Right, and, and um, they actually—it's—it's it's, um, there, there's actually part of training is that you have to, you know, you have to deal with sort of the the, the pragmatic a aspects first, and then you can sort of 
you know, consider the psychological consequences later. But I will say on, on a more positive note is that people who've had sort of delayed symptoms or systems that, you know, that, you know it, people still can get better, even if they delay years before they get help. Okay, so the question was, um, is there a cumulative dose response for adverse mental health consequences? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, and um, in fact, there's been really nice work done with uh, surveys of people doing multiple deployments of uh, going to Iraq and Afghanistan, and there's no question that more num the larger number of deployments increases the risk of PTSD and other symptoms. There have been other studies, too, looking at, uh, there was a um, study actually done in Kaiser years ago called the ACE study, you know, Adverse Childhood Events Study, and that uh, cumulative exposure did increase the risk of mental health problems and actually increased the risk for physical health problems, too, heart disease um, um, and other metabolic problems. Yes? Isn't there a doctor that specializes in that, in that solely in the baby? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. right, right. And, and actually, I have colleagues at the VA doing the same thing, doing work in studying cardiovascular disease. And, uh, um, and, and cumulative trauma exposure is, a, is is, is, is there's cumulative exposure or, uh, risk for both psychological and physical health consequences. Um, okay. All right, so what are risk factors for PTSD? I think I actually mentioned most of these. I, I, I was starting to talk about education is weakly protective, um, but the lion's share of predictive uh, power is in the severity of the event. Okay, so unfortunately, as I mentioned, it's rare that PTSD just exists in isolation. So often people with chronic persistent PTSD do develop other problems, you know, alcohol and drug problems, particularly in men. 50% uh, of men with chronic PTSD will at some point in their life have a diagnosis of alcohol abuse. Uh, and that does seem to be the drug of choice for a lot of returning soldiers. Um, and there's higher rates of aggression and violence. There's higher rates of suicide. I've already mentioned dissociation. Um, but probably the biggest impairment is the interpersonal consequences, the becoming distant and cut off and disenfranchised, which affects work and relationships and, and, and ultimately can lead to you know, calamitous consequences like homelessness. Uh, these are some of the comorbid risks, and, I, and I, you can see that there's high rates of depression and generalized anxiety disorder, panic, uh, but the big sex difference is around alcohol uh, and drug use, higher in men. So how do you screen for it? And this is really something that someone in primary care might do, you know, where if you, um, especially in a high-risk population, you might, you know, some of the questions you might consider. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? How did you react when it happened? Do the memories of this event still bother you? Did you get over it? Uh, do you avoid situations that remind you of this event? Have your relationships suffered since this exposure? Are you more nervous? Is it hard for you to relax? Yes? Yeah, so the question is, can you develop PTSD from just learning of a terrible uh, diagnosis? Um, you know, I have to tell you, there's kind of a raging debate about that. You know, some people say that's part of life, that's normal experiences. You know, can you have PTSD from a nasty custody battle and a rancorous divorce? Um, we, we actually did a study of um, police officers, you know, PTSD in San Francisco Bay Area, Oakland, and New York City cops. And we would give them these trauma questionnaires and they would fill out all these symptoms, you know, nightmares and intrusive memories. And then they would later report what the trauma was. And it was often things like, you know, divorce. Um, so we in the trauma field have this whole thing, idea that this is qualitative separation of things like traumatic ex events versus something that's kind of normal, a normative human experience. But as far as the psychological responses to it, you can still have all the same pattern of symptoms, intrusive memories, nightmares avoidance of uh, memory. So I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, the reason why it's so hotly debated is that it creates a kind of a legal forensic nightmare. Because PTSD is a forensic diagnosis and it has consequences in the courtroom. And has, you know, 
litigation issues. And so it, it's a, you know, if you get into that field, you can sort of, you can see why you want to avoid saying yes to that, to, to that question. So I don't know whether trauma is the right word to use when a child of any age, under the age of 18, <clears throat> sees something on TV or reads about it or hears about it, but usually the visual effects, whether it's a natural disaster or some other horrific thing that constantly on the news, what do we know about the effects of that on kids? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's... I, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, there's a lot, that, that's a whole field actually about, uh, you know, kids who have seen, you know, there's some fantastic number of murders they've seen by the time they reach age 13. You know, they, how many murders they've seen on TV. Um, video game, sing, you know, shooter, single shooter perspectives where you, you know, that's, that's the game. Um, you know, watch. real events, not fantasy events. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, what, there, the diagnostic nomenclature has shifted a little bit. In DSM-3, the terminology was an exposure to an event that was beyond the range of normal human experiences. And that would not include watching TV uh, or learning that you have cancer. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, or fortunately, um, what is true that there are some people who are sort of uniquely vulnerable, and even though um, that wouldn't be a traumatic event for most people, it, it can be for a, an unusually vulnerable person. I mean, there have been cases of PTSD described from people who were pulled over for a traffic stop, and they saw a man with a gun walking up to their window and wrapped on their glass, and it was the most terrifying experience of their life. And they've had nightmares and intrusive memories of that event and never felt safe since that time. And for them, it was a calamitous event in their life. And for, for many people, that was a, you know, an annoying you know, traffic stop because uh, a blink, you know, a light was out in the back. So, you know, one, so what, I mean, the real dilemma in this field is that trauma is so ideographic. And that, um, you know, in this cop study, yeah, we ask cops, most, most cops are resilient, they don't have PTSD, but of those people who do have it, the small number, um, you ask them, what was it? What's the event that really haunts you? And, you know, it's very ideographic. It's not being shot at, it's not, you know, getting pummeled by, you know, some event. It's, you know, going on a domestic, you know, a violence call and seeing a battered kid. And, like, that's a horrific image that the police officers never recovered from. Right, so um, I have to repeat what you said and what you just said, <laughs> what, what, so what you just said actually summarizes the mo most important point from this lecture. Um, and that is that the, the, the most important thing to do in a disaster zone is to foster interpersonal social support. That is the most important thing to do. And actually, the Manhattan data really underscore that. You, you, thank you for pointing that out. That um, it, it really is. And actually, you know what the biggest risk for soldiers is? When they, when, you know, multiple deployment soldiers? Guess, guess what it is? It's separation from service. So they have this, they, they live in a community that understands what they experience. And when they leave that, that, that they're, they're really, you know, they're, that, that, that's, that's a real, that's the real stress. Isn't that part of why they re-enlist? Re Absolutely. Shame. Absolutely. Shame. Yes. Desire yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about neurobiology, uh, just for a little bit. Um, and that is that, you know, the, the, I mean, there's good news. <laughs> The good news is that we as adults are still capable of growing new neurons, you know, new neurons, neurogenesis. And it is true that stress has a negative impact on that. That bad, you know, severe stress reduces the growth of new neurons, even in the aging brain. Um, and of course, there's a whole literature looking at the hippocampus is where, the hippocampus is where there's a certain part of it where these new neurons are capable of growing. 
And all I'm going to show you here is that the dots that fall below that line show that people with PTSD have smaller hippocampus. So most studies have shown that severe stress PTSD shrinks the hippocampus in some way, we think. Um, now, having a smaller hippocampus to begin with, as was demonstrated by this twin study, identical twins, where the hippocampus size of the unexposed twin actually predicted PTSD symptoms in the exposed twin. So in other words, having a smaller hippocampus was a risk factor for developing PTSD. Um, and then we, you know, we also know that PTSD, untreated and persistent, is a risk factor for dementia. So what's happening to the brain over time? And this is some work that Val Cardenas Nicholson did from our group years ago, looking at accelerated atrophy in people with PTSD. OK. But then on, on, on a more hopeful note, uh, another uh, person from our group, uh, Brigitte Apfel, published data on hippocampal volume. And people who recovered from PTSD were no different from controls. So, so it's scary, right, that the hippocampus can shrink, but hippocampus is a very plastic structure, and there's evidence of recovery. Um, and I'm a sleep researcher, actually. I'm a sleep PTSD researcher, and sleep is a really big, important part for why our brains recover. And sleep is very much involved with healthy new neuron growth, even in the aging brain. And this is just show you that that the higher your insomnia ratings are, that the smaller the volume of this area of the brain where there are these, new, these neural stem cells grow. Um, and I'm going to kind of breeze through this. This is also showing that higher uh, symptom severity of pad sleep is associated with smaller volumes, not just in uh, the hippocampus, but actually in total cortical gray matter. All right. And then on the encouraging side, Treatment, in this case, is a treatment with an antidepressant shown, has been shown to actually increase the size of the hippocampus. So we are very, we're, 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 we're adaptable, we're flexible. And even people who have had PTSD for long, many years can show adaptive changes with treatment. And in fact, that's one of the questions that we've been pursuing in, in our research studies is, does, does treatment actually increase the size of the hippocampus? And, We've had several studies that were underway. One is looking at targeting insomnia. We're, we're in the middle of an exercise study in collaboration with the Osher Center. Uh, uh, we call it integrative exercise. It's a, a mix of mindful breathing with strength training and aerobics uh, for people with uh, veterans with PTSD. And we're doing imaging pre and post, and we're in the middle of that trial. You had a question? Why, why it would change, or? It, well, I would actually think it would be a bigger, since that's kind of the fear response, right? So the, the hippocampus, you need a good hippocampus, uh, a healthy hippocampus in order to, for new learning. And one of the tasks of recovering from trauma is to form new memories that kind of um, override the trauma memory. So if you got in a very bad car accident, um, you need to sort of relearn the idea that you can be in a car and, and, and be safe. You know, we were talking about this person who had a terrible plane accident or was in a you know, disaster and got on a plane a week later. You know, you need a healthy hippocampus to learn that yet you can get back on a plane and, and be safe. Um, but the other thing is that the, 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 the stress hormones and stress um, neurotransmitters have sort of a, have a potentially a toxic effect on the hippocampus. And treating PTSD appears to alleviate that, too. So there's, there's several, there are multiple issues. You know, aside from insomnia and exercise, which are, these are the two trials that we actually are doing, um, some of the things that we're hoping to do is looking at pharmacotherapy, but also risk factor reduction, smoking cessation, um, health behaviors, you know, to, to improve brain health. Yes? Question about that. So, if it's sleep that is natural sleep, does it vary from sleep that is uh, precipitated by something like trazodone? Yeah, no one knows the answer to that, but it's a great question to ask. Yeah, the pro and, and we, see, we're doing it with behavioral treatment because we don't want to have the drug confound. Because you know, if, 
let's say you do show some effect on the brain, is it sleep or is it the presence of the drug? So it's, it's, it's easier to test that hypothesis with a behavioral treatment. But it's a really good question. And it's, um, you know, there have been studies that are looking at different features of sleep uh, with on and off drugs, and the, and the literature's mixed. You know, the ability, there's, there's something that happens during sleep that's really quite extraordinary. There's a, there's a more interstitial fluid that's called glymphatics that help clear you know, proteins that are been secreted during the day, and you need this kind of flushing of the brain that happens during the night. Uh, it's really kind of it's a, a recent discovery. It's got everyone excited because uh, there's a 61% increase in interstitial fluid volume in the brain during sleep, and it helps clear amyloid and tau and things that are involved in neurodegenerative illnesses. Um, that same increase in fluid does occur with drug-induced sleep. So uh, at least in that system, the drug-induced sleep appears to be as normal as you know, healthy sleep. But in other things like the effects of sleep on, on sleep-dependent learning, the drugs are not helpful for that. Kind of as you'd expect, because the drugs have, often have their own effects on memory. OK. Um, is chronic PTSD associated with accelerated aging? Um, we actually have data that it is. Uh, Christine Yaffe, who's uh, also on our faculty, published years ago. Uh, we've been looking at, uh, with Liz Blackburn, uh, looking at telomeres and show that they are shorter. Telomeres is a, a sort of a molecular uh, surrogate marker of aging, cellular aging. And we've got a couple of studies that I'll tell you a little bit about looking at this question. Uh, but this is the data. This is looking at in a veteran national uh, VA database, comparing veterans with and without a diagnosis of PTSD, and the cumulative rate of, dep uh, of dementia is double. Um, and it's really, in, you know, it's a really important question for us to figure out why that is. Is it is it a vascular problem? Is it from, uh, you know, is it Alzheimer's type dementia from amyloid? Is it uh, you know, a non-Alzheimer's tauopathy, or what exactly is it? And that's one of the questions we're trying to understand. And of course, more importantly, do you stave off that risk by, by treatment? You know, because obviously that's what we want to do. Uh, I mentioned the telomere data, so just showing that telomeres, which are the, you know, basically the caps on the end of chromosomes, the longer they are, the you know, the, 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 the better, and they're, 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 they're longer in younger people, and they get shorter as we age. Um, and age matched PTSD and controls, they were shorter. And actually, it turned out that childhood trauma seemed to predict uh, shortening of telomeres, too. This is work done by Aoife O'Donovan, who was in our group here, was on faculty. And then this is just an imaging study where we're asking that, you know, what is it? Is it, is, it a, is it a vascular event happening in the brain in people with PTSD? Is it amyloid? We're doing PET amyloid scans or we're looking at uh, tau, tau imaging. All right, let's get back to disasters. Um, so obviously <laughs> approaches to disasters happen at multiple levels. I've been very kind of you know, I mentioned right from the beginning, I think the role of the mental health professional is, is, is limited. Um, it's really, it's the first line responders, you know, the community, primary care physicians, emergency room physicians that really need to sort of be prepared and understand how to help. Um, there needs to be some network of mental health providers, but really in the, in the face of more acute, you know, uh, but chronic PTSD, symptoms that are persistent for a, a month or longer. Um, and then, as you were saying, the, the educating the public about healthy coping, you know, the kinds of things that you described in San Bruno about the community, the importance of people binding together, you know, and helping each other, um, and not, you know, and not allowing themselves to isolate. Um, so psychological first aid. So uh, this is a term that was recently coined kind of out of the debate of do you really want mental health people at ground zero? Uh, is there something iatrogenic about that? Because in f first, do no harm. You know, don't go into a disaster zone and say, oh God, I'm sorry, you're at risk for PTSD. <laughs> um, you know, th that, that's not a good thing to do. Um, 
So keep in mind that most people are resilient, and then really, you know, disasters have to focus on the most basic needs. And just look at those photographs of the Katrina disaster, and it's, it's almost obvious how important that is. And promote social engagement. Um, that is, I, I really believe that is the that take home uh, feature for people who have lost people, you know, have deaths. Uh, of course, we have to attend to grief. Uh, and the real issue about mental health services is when. When do you do it? Um, and and people are saying maybe more on the four week time frame. We don't. I don't. I don't. I don't take that too, you know, um, seriously. But it's a reasonable t uh, time frame. Most people are going to have symptoms for a few days or even a few weeks that are going to remit. Okay, what's been done? Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about psychological debriefing. There was a whole literature on that, um, and it was kind of an attractive idea that you get people to put words, um, put feelings into words, create a narrative, and. Um, Maybe by having a story, a narrative through debriefing, you would make people, they would organize the trauma better. And so this was really started in the military. It was actually adopted very much by police and fire departments um, in the 80s. It was still persistent in the 90s and post 9-11, but most people have, have steered away from it. And I'll show you why. Uh, there have been these uh, cognitive treatments, cognitive behavior treatments called exposure therapy. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. And there's been a handful of smaller studies looking at sort of supportive counseling, dynamic psychotherapy. And we already talked about the propranolol study. It's a story, it's a very interesting idea. It's, and the question still needs to be addressed because we haven't, it's not easy to randomize people in these trials. <laughs> you know, understandably, you know. Okay, psychological debriefing. So it was a one-shot deal. It's usually within 72 hours of a trauma. And sometimes it's done individually, sometimes it's a group. And you ask the person to go into full bloody detail of what happened to it and emphasize the facts and the cognitions and their feeling, maybe provide some education about normal responses uh, and or even prepare for later emotional reactions. So there was a study that actually randomized people to receive debriefing, yes, no, in motor vehicle accidents. So this scale here is called the impact of event scale. And the higher the numbers here, the more PTSD symptoms you see. So what you see here is that if you had low symptoms right at the beginning, it really didn't matter if you were debriefed or not. You know, you're followed longitudinally four months, three years later. You have low symptoms at the beginning, you have low symptoms follow up. No problem. The real issue is that if you had high symptoms right around the time of the event and you got debriefed and randomized debriefing, look what happens. Four months and three years, you actually have more symptoms than you did if you didn't get it. Um, so what, what, what's the take home point from this? So, Exposure therapy does get people to talk about their trauma, you know. And, but tr exposure therapy works because you don't just talk about it once. You talk about it again and again and again and again. That's how it works. You talk about your trauma the very first time you tell that story. The very, you, know, you tell somebody you were raped and you tell it for the first time. That's upsetting. And if that's it, you're done. Um, you know, it, there's not really strong evidence to show that that's helpful. The real juice in exposure therapy is that you tell it again and again and again and again, and you even listen to yourself telling the story, tapes of you telling your story, and listening to it and practicing it. And what happens is that repetition makes that story less impactful. You have less of a big amplitude of response, and as you have less of a, an emotional response to hearing your own story, you start to feel like you have some mastery over it. You know, and so it's, um, so anyhow, that's the take home point about debriefing. The real problem about debriefing is that it's not okay to just do a one shot deal. You need, you need, you need to be able to do it at least a few sessions for it to be helpful. <laughs>
Okay, so there have been some attempts to do this, four to five weekly sessions, and, and I'll just tell you that they, they, they've been shown to be useful. The problem is, of course, is the same problem. Who are these people? Do you refer everybody to, for four or five sessions of cognitive therapy who you see in the emergency room? And, and I think you know, the answer is no. I think that's still potentially iatrogenic. Um, the, real, the real question is, could you do this in people one month after the emergency room? And there are some, a handful of centers that are trying to implement this and at least study it. Uh, but, you know, it involves interventions and, you know, a lot of education, breath retraining, demuscle relaxation, but a lot of it is exposure, recounting the assault, cognitive restructuring. You know, I can't trust people. And people are no longer trustworthy. You know, sort of cognitively sort of going after that. Is that really an accurate assumption? Okay. So exposure therapy, I've already talked about. Cognitive is sort of the kinds of assumptions you make about yourself and other people that can sometimes be distorted. You can, you can sometimes feel, make catastrophic assumptions about safety. I mean, you know, people, it's really common to hear combat veterans talk about how they just can't stand to be in a grocery store. Like, they, you know, their visual field is, is cut off. There are these tall stacks that cut off visual you know, you, you don't know who's on the other side. And then the, really the cognitive work is to say, all right, you, don't, you can't see who's over in aisle two. I mean, is that really so important? I mean, it's, it's that kind of, it is that kind of nuts and bolts cognitive, you know, sort of challenging people about how, how realistically dangerous is it now to go into safe, Safeway? Is it really the same as being, you know, in the, in the war zone? That's cognitive therapy. Um, there are other things that have been looked at. In the Bay Area in particular, uh, EMDR, eye movement uh, desensitization reprocessing. I'll, I won't go much into that other than just say it's another form of exposure therapy, which seems to work. OK. So um, one big model of PTSD is fear conditioning. Um, and that is you take a neutral stimulus and you pair it with something terrible. Um, you know, traumatic stimulus, and then it, and it becomes a fear response, you know, to when, when that stimulus is shown. So you're, you're driving in a car, something terrible happens, and now what was a neutral stimulus, being in the car now is now a trauma cue. And, um, and you, exposure to that trauma cue leads to a fear response. If you were attacked in an elevator, you go back into another elevator, another building, you bet you're in an elevator, and it's a cue, and you, and you have fear response. So, and often people with PTSD never allow themselves to go back in another elevator. That's it. I'm not, I, don't, I don't ever want to feel that kind of panic. And the avoidance of that cuts off the possibility of relearning new experiences. That, yes, you can go into an elevator and not be harmed by that. Um, and that is the essence of exposure therapy. It's extinction. Extinction is new learning. It means you go back in that elevator and you survive. And, um, and you do it repeatedly and you now create a new form of memory. Uh, for a lot of Vietnam veterans, um, traveling back to Vietnam as a tourist was a, like a life-changing event. You know, they, they, they can now create new memories of Vietnam. They, they, they have new memories of Vietnam that, that uh, competes with uh, old traumatic memories. OK. So drugs, um, there are some antidepressants in particular that have been looked at for the treatment of PTSD. This is, um, I'll just mention that PTSD is not one of these disorders in psychiatry where a drug alone really does create a big uh, therapeutic response. Sometimes you do in, in treatment of major depression or treatment of panic disorder. You give an antidepressant and there's a hallelujah response and they, they feel a lot better. It's so rare to see that in PTSD with, with medications. The effects are not as robust. And so it's, it's, um, there are medications that have shown to be of some use, but, but remission from medications alone is really rare. Um, the ones that have been studied the most are the antidepressants. There's only two approved by the FDA and they're, they're both SSRIs, or serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The two in particular are sertraline and paroxetine. They're both generic. Uh, other studies that have been looked at, other antidepressants, are 
venlafaxine, duloxetine, uh, nefazidone, trazodone, mirtazapine. There's been, I'll talk a little bit about this category here, this adrenergic inhibiting agents. And I already mentioned that there's very little data about benzodiazepines and it, it was not very encouraging. Uh, almost no data on anticonvulsants and the data on atypical antipsychotics is ugly. You know, they, they, it doesn't seem to work and they, and they have a lot of metabolic side effects. So the adrenergic inhibiting agents are very interesting. There's a drug called prazosin, which was originally marketed as mini-press, as a blood pressure medicine. Um, it turns out it's not a great blood pressure medicine. It, you know, chronic use people don't really show a big drop in blood pressure. But it does show, it, uh, it's been found at night to help with nightmares. You know, you, you give people with nightmares this drug and they seem to sleep a lot better and their broad PTSD symptoms seem to get better. And it's a very attractive idea because it's a short half-life drug. It's not a psychiatric drug. Um, and it's not as, you know, people don't feel sedated or altered during the day. So it's a, there's been a lot of excitement about prazosin, and it's dirt cheap, it's generic. Um, so yes, yeah, so prazosin targets a certain type of adrenergic receptor in the brain that's in, actually in the amygdala. And it seems to uh, be in our, the areas of the brain that we think are very much involved in, in uh, PTSD, you know, the amygdala, hippocampus, and it seems to really help regulate sleep. All right, um, so I, I mentioned the basis of exposure therapy is extinction, and that is sort of, uh, and there are, there are ways in which extinction itself is, can be tracked and, and examined and studied. Uh, and, and glutamate is a neurotransmitter, and someone mentioned ketamine. Um, you know, one way of facilitating uh, glutamate is ketamine, um, and uh, it's very controversial because ketamine has a lot of sort of psychomimetic uh, adverse effects. People feel altered from it, um, and I'd say the jury is out. There, there is one controlled study of a single dose of ketamine that seems to have been useful for PTSD, uh, but it's, um, you know, its use in chronic PTSD is really not known, and there's a lot of reasons to be worried about it. Okay, so um, just to summarize about treatments, um, CBT and exposure therapy is very effective. Uh, the serotonin reuptake inhibitors and praises in our pharmacologic treatments that are of choice for PTSD. And when people respond, they, it, it, it appears that all the symptoms do improve. Um, and achieving remission is comparable to other anxiety disorders with both psychological and, and pharmacologic treatment. And um, you know, there's, dur there's evidence of durability of benefit. So I'll stop here. We're at 8.30, and I guess we, we have time for, we have another, we have time for more questions? Yes. Uh, right, right. So the answer is yes, and that we do have these, actually, we actually have these disaster training drills. There's a phone tree that every physician has about, you know, who you expect to be hearing from and who you call next and what you can do. Um, now, in fairness, I think the different centers around the, around the city have different expertise. There's no question that the best place for neurosurgical trauma is going to be San Francisco General Hospital. So there is a helipad by my hospital, the VA, and that's not to bring people to the VA, it's to get them from the VA over to San Francisco General. Yeah. Right, right. So the question was, uh, is mental health services covered by insurance companies uh, for, for mental health problems post-disaster? And I will, so my first disclaimer is to say, um, I work at a federal hospital. <laughs> so um, I, 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 and one of the great benefits of working in a federal hospital is I never have to ask that question. Because um, I know that the answer to that question, unfortunately, is, com is fantastically complex. And of course, there have been legislation about, you know, creating parity for mental health, you know, coverage. But honestly, I think it's really variable from plan to plan. Absolutely, yeah. Even what you just described there, you don't need to have gone to medical school and to psychiatry residency training and learned about differential diagnosis of mental disorders. 
be trained to, you need to protect the people from the press, you need to make sure that their basic needs are being attended to, that they, they have ways of networking with their families, as there's ways where they can get shelter, food. I mean, the basic needs have to be addressed first. And, and honestly, the mental health people who go rushing to ground zero end up doing those tasks anyhow. And it really ends, they end up being helpful, but using things that have nothing to do with their training. From what I'm gleaning from your talk, having good social support and connections is an important part of your resilience. But would you comment on any other suggestions you might have or, or any research that's been done about what individuals can do to improve their personal or family preparedness for disasters? I mean, it sounds like it might be something more complicated than just having a disaster plan of what each family member is going to do, where they're going to go, who they're going to contact, that type of thing. But are there other things that, that you might do for good preparation? Well, I mean, a, a, cre a key aspect of a disaster plan, besides having the the bag with the food and the water and everything, is that everyone in your family knows how they're going to try to reach each other. I mean, that's a big deal because sort of the panic of how do you locate your daughter? How do you, you know, how do you? Where, where there's some understanding. You know, some people describe um, either real or virtual meeting places that they've agreed to. You know, that they're going to check in with, uh, and that's really critical. Um, I really don't have a more sophisticated answer to that, other than I think the most important thing is for people not to become inwardly focused and to use the people who you're close to and, 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 and just be with them. You know, whether it's a family member or a clergy or somebody or a close friend, and that, that's really it. Well, thank you all for, uh, for listening and participating. Yeah.